Good afternoon and welcome to our first virtual arts and medicine Monday lecture. My name is Tess Jones. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities and the Director of the Arts and Humanities and Healthcare Program. I invite all of you to visit our website, www.coloradobioethics, that's all one word, coloradobioethics.org, for more information about upcoming arts and medicine presentations. And this includes our 2020-2021 lecture series, Intersections of Race, Class, and Health. So, Please go to the website and take a look, and we hope to see you at some of these uh, presentations as well. Our guest today was scheduled for April 2020, but to borrow Susan Sontag's title for her play about AIDS, this is, quote, the way we live now. And we are so grateful to, uh, for everyone's patience, resilience, and flexibility, and especially that of our presenter today, Dr. Neil Prose. Um, Dr. Prose is Professor of Pediatrics, Dermatology, and Global Health, and he's co-director of the Health Humanities Lab at Duke University. He is a world-renowned educator in doctor-patient communications, developing curricula across the U.S. and in medical schools in South Africa, Botswana, and Kenya. He is currently creating a curriculum in respectful maternity care for midwives, midwife, midwifery students, and other carers in Ethiopia and Chilean Patagonia. Dr. Prose began Reimagine Medicine 2020, the now virtual summer humanities fellowship program for undergraduate students preparing for careers in healthcare with the following statement and question. It begins with curiosity. What if we approached each patient as a work of art? Well, with the documentary you're going to see today, Keepers of the House, which he produced with Dr. Ray Barfield, Neil expands this by approaching each person on the healthcare team as a work of art, as a unique and indispensable caregiver. Keepers of the House explored the notion of just who are our essential workers before we began to ask that question six plus months ago. Now, before I turn it over to Dr. Neil Prose, let me give you some logistical info. First of all, we invite your questions and your comments. And if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tool, and that's where you can uh, make those comments and post those questions. Secondly, if you look in your chat, there is a link to the film and we're providing this in case the viewing of the film in real time on Zoom gets choppy. So with that, I welcome Dr. Neil Prose and I turn it over to you, Dr. Neil Prose. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you so much for having me and it's a pleasure to be with all of you virtually. I wish we, I still wish we could be in person, but as you said, times have changed. And so I'll say two words about the film and then we'll, ro we'll roll the film. And after the film, I'm gonna ask for some quick thoughts and reactions. And then we have the wonderful privilege of having Ms. Joanne Hunter with us, who's one of the housekeepers at our hospital. And we're gonna to speak to her for a few minutes about her work and her work during COVID. And then uh, I'll be saying a few more words about housekeepers and appreciation and then open for discussion. So basically, this, the idea of this film began about four years ago when I was in conversation with Ray Barfield, my colleague, and we were talking together about the ways that housekeepers provide emotional support for patients and their families. And more important or equally important, the fact that many of us in healthcare, doctors, nurses, never seem to notice what housekeepers are actually doing uh, to help patients in addition to cleaning. And so we were fortunate, I had the very, uh, I made the very wise choice many years ago of marrying a documentary filmmaker, Rhonda Klavansky, and she and I set to work uh, to create this brief documentary called Keepers of the House. So I'm gonna do my best to roll the film, 
and then uh, it's 15 minutes long. And then when it's done, uh, we'll kind of resume with uh, some questions and some thoughts and a short interview. So bear with me while I try to find share screen. Oh, and, and, and as Tess said, if it sounds hard, the sound is not gonna match the picture exactly. It's just the way Zoom is. If it's really horrible, uh, I recommend switching to the uh, YouTube link that we sent you. So if I go to share screen and then screen, hopefully and this and this uh, and whoops. This and this. Whoops, and maximize. Wait. Aha. Myself, good morning, say hey to everybody. And then we, our routine is to set your card up. And after setting the card up, you'll go and you pull your trash. We have 32 rooms as a housekeeper to take care of. And after you set your card up, you'll knock on the patient door, introduce yourself. I'll just go in, Barbara, my name Barbara, I'll be your housekeeper for the day. Then I will write my name on the, the chalkboard so there are no EVS that I will be the housekeeper. And while I'm doing it, I'll just get there talking to the patients, asking them where they're from, how they're doing. And then during that time, I'll get to know a little bit about them and then I'll tell them about myself, like where I'm from. I go in and I say, hi, my name is LaShara Springs. I'm your housekeeper today. I take out their trash. I come back and I sanitize their surfaces. I clean their bathroom. I restock their supplies and I ask them, is there anything else that I can do for them? We don't inflict any harm. We don't ask you for anything. We're only there to clean and sanitize your environment. So oftentimes people feel very comfortable to share even some of their most inner secrets and, and thoughts and feelings with us because the walls are down. A lot of them will tell you just their whole life history and whatnot. And it's, it's really amazing. And like I say, we, uh, the one with the wheelchair, we were sitting in his room all day and we just got to talking about the way the world's going on right now and just how, you know, and we got to talking about the Lord and all of that. And it was, uh, like I say, I was in his room probably got 15, 20 minutes just talking about the way the world is and the Lord and whatnot. Yeah, I have a, a friend. I call her friend now because we don't have a lot of family around. Every day when I come in, I was trying to um, engage with her and make her feel better, and, uh, make her feel like she's not alone. And for Christmas, New Year's, and Valentine, and Mother's Day, we're still um, talking. She told me that we need the doctors and the nurses, but sometimes other people within another department can bring a sunshine in the room when they need it. I came in contact with a lady, she had an LVAD, and before she was she was adamant about not getting it. And I was just like, you know, you have this little baby at home who needs a mom. Now she's at home, you know, she can be there with her baby, she can watch her, watch her child grow up. So I feel like I helped her with that process, because like I said, she was adamant about not getting her LVAD. She's like, no, I'm not doing this, I don't want it. And every morning I'm like, come on, we gotta, you gotta get this done, we have to. You have to be there for your child. I think of them, many of them, many times, and the things that they had gone through. I have put a cloth that the mother gave to her son one time, and when they was discharged, I say, here is the prayer cloth that you left. He said, no, you keep it, you know, and so what? And I keep that on my bed. It's a little piece I got on my bed, I keep that. And I always, you know, got different prayers and stuff on. On my floor, we do a lot of dinners and potlucks and stuff. And sometimes, you know, we'll be in the room, and I will let the patient know that, hey, I cook some collard greens, or I cook 
fried cornbread or potato salad coals. I'm a country cooker. Last week, we had a dinner. So the patient was like, I haven't had no fried cornbread since I was a little boy. I said, you want me to bring you a plate of food? He said, yes. He said, oh, I can use a good plate of food. And I had the okay from the nurse. I made potato salad and fried cornbread, collard greens. He said, I never ate no food like that in my life. A patient came, uh, it was in children. They came and uh, I think they didn't have enough, uh, you know, like money-wise. So I collect some money to make sure they had some food to eat. And at that time, I even asked EBS, did they have some meal tickets for them? And we fed the family and they was happy. Never forget this patient. Oh wow! The family members, you know, they were there on a daily basis, especially her sister. And uh, at times, her brother will be there, mother, you know, in-laws. They were in a smaller room, and I realized that it was so crowded. And one day, I did discharge cleaning in one of the larger rooms, and I asked the charge nurse if there's any way they could, you know, move this family member to that room. And the charge nurse did it. She transferred them to that room and they were so happy. They were like, Lana, this is all because of you. I think she's 96 years old, this lady was. So I go in there and she, she was just as smart as a whip. She got a good mind. And so we were sitting talking and then her son, he was sitting in there with her. And he was telling us about they live on in the country. And I'm like, yeah, I said, you will. I know y'all got a garden out there. He said, yeah, we're planting a garden. He said, my mama, it's a collard seed that they have. I said, I try to plant a little garden too. So they said, well, we have these special cabbage collard seeds and we're gonna um, bring you some of these seeds back. And he called me last week. He said, Miss Barbara, did you still up there on the floor? And so he said, well, guess what? I got you your college seeds like I told you you're going to have them. And I was happy about them because you know what I did with them? Since the season broke, they're in the ground. I hope I do get some cabbage collars. They're fascinated with my accent, so they're always asking me where you're from. And when I say Jamaica, then we talk about food, we talk about music. Sometimes the patients and I will sing together, like Bob Marley, don't worry about a thing, and we'll sing together. Don't worry about a thing. And they'll sing with me. One doctor, at one time, it was a patient. Well, I really don't like to think about it, but tell me to go in and talk to this patient. So I'm taking more, more time with this patient. He wasn't, he was giving up. He was not fighting with condition or whatever it was that he had. He was just giving up and she wanted me to go in there and talk to him and to uplift him and give him something to fight about. You know, to help fight. Cause sometimes people give up. He listened to my compelling in his eyes the way he moved his eyes because he was a prisoner, you know? And I would talk, I'd say, you know everything that you done, that's the law for forgiveness and so on, but you still live in there. When you go back, you start telling them, bring other people up that's in there and help the younger folks out that's in there. Hago diferentes cosas. Hago housekeeper, hago intérprete, hago, les ayudo a lo que es la lactación, le, a veces a las mamás. Le digo yo, mira, ponlo así o de cualquier manera que ellas se sientan, a, o sea, le digo yo a ella, esto yo lo mismo pasaba con mi niño. Cuando una mamá está muy cansada, yo veo que tiene su bebé en sus brazos y yo llego, usted sabe que hay mamás que a veces se quedan de repente. Entonces yo a veces vengo yo y le digo yo, mamá, pon tu bebé en tu camita. Como la semana pasada estaba una bien cansada y le digo yo, mamá, eh, disculpa, te voy a subir esto. Porque ella estaba así como, como, como media dormitada y el bebé lo tenía. Y, y dice ella, no, había, no me había puesto a pensar que, que se, puede, se me puede caer. Entonces lo que hice yo fue ponerle, levantarle y ponerle una almohada. Le digo, ya sí está más segura. Y yo me siento más tranquila. Son muchas las emociones en este lugar. Día con día hay personas 
felices porque acaban de ser padres por primera vez o tal vez hay otra en otro cuarto tristes porque acaban de perder a un ser querido. Cuando yo recién comencé a trabajar acá, yo llegué a un cuarto y estaba el paciente estaba sentado en la orilla de su cama y yo estuve hablando con él, él se miraba perfectamente bien, estuve hablando, limpié su cuarto y, y ya me moví al siguiente cuarto, limpié otros dos cuartos más cuando de repente un código blue azul que llaman y eso quiere decir que alguien está mal, vienen todos y maybe tal vez 10 minutos después el paciente ya no respondía. So, esa fue una situación un poco triste y muy difícil porque fue la primera que yo experimenté. Fue un poco difícil, y, pero hablando con los compañeros y ellos me dijeron de que cosas así yo tenía que estar expuesta al, cuando yo estaba trabajando acá, que poco a poco yo me iba a ir acostumbrando a ser más fuerte, que era normal cuando es primera vez. Yeah, oftentimes um, what happens is a, a housekeeper will build up a strong rapport with a patient. Someone who may be with us for two days, they may be with us for two weeks, they may be with us for two months. And our housekeepers probably more often than not had no idea something happened with that patient until they returned to work the next day. Um, and then they're kind of left to deal with it with their other housekeeping mates, so to speak, or uh, housekeeping management, what will happen is this, this is basically how it gets communicated. I know that person was in room 611, and now they're not. But that's where it becomes vitally important that if you do have these huddles, then you know. And there's no guess in that, because it, it is talked about, you know, kind of throughout the unit, and everyone knows, and it's not like we're, we're segregated from the group. It takes a toll on me. Yeah, it does. Because you get so familiar with them, you know, and you watch them deteriorate, it kills me. It, it really hurts. Family members are there, you know, sometimes they're the ones, as a matter of fact, most of the time, they're the ones that are telling me that such and such passed, and then we hug and console them. It's really hard, though. It's really, really hard working on that unit. Sometimes I'm like, I have to get off this unit, but I stay because I really like the nurses there. They're very great. They work with me, and you know we're like a team up there, so it's okay. Lo que yo hago en mi en mi área no no solo es housekeeper. Yo hago eso muchos detallitos que que a veces quizás hay personas mi mi supervisor no se da cuenta que yo las hago. No solo limpiar como se dice. Hay conversar con el paciente también ayuda mucho. A veces están deprimidas, a veces hay mamás que están llorando y a veces yo les digo, ¿quieres un vaso de agua? o ¿Quieres, ¿quieres que traiga un vasito de agua? ¿O estás bien? ¿O quieres que le hable a tu enfermera? Todo eso son peca pequeños detalles que uno hace. This person is here for a reason. They're sick, seeking their healing for a reason. And are we not engaged, are we not thinking about that actual human being that's in that bed versus I need to give this person their test. I need to make sure that they receive this. I need to get these things. And we really need to, to just take a few minutes out of, out of every time that we have an interaction with someone just to check on their true well-being. But you have to take those few minutes to listen to them. And sometimes that's all the people want to do is to be listened to. They get a lot out of them when you just listen to them. So I not talk, you don't have to say that much or so what, but let them do the talking. I came to love it, like I even started going to school for a healthcare career because since working in the hospital, it's really gotten me interested in the hospital setting because me being a housekeeper has grown, has made me grown to love patients, healthcare, interaction with patients, interaction with nurses, interaction with the whole hospital staff.
with our Republican friends to solve problems like by relieving the post office of this $5 billion annual obligation. But first, we've got to make sure that the post office is not being led by criminals. This is a real problem. So I thank the chair. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee. Um, was that a question you were putting to Mr. Painter? Well, he would be welcome to opine. I know he's, Mr. Painter, you may respond, yeah, yeah. even though the gentleman's time has expired. I am very... I don't know where that sound is coming from. I think it was coming from your YouTube video. Uh, oh, no. Okay, sorry, everybody. No worries. I apologize. Just a moment. Oh, dear. Shoo. Okay. <sighs> All right. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you for bringing that out, Tess. I was totally mystified. All right. So I'm just going to, um, now we got past that, I'm going to post uh, a few questions for reflection. And I'm going to ask you to uh, just respond in the chat with thoughts about these three questions. And then we'll kind of, I'll, I'll try to respond to some of those there and we'll move on from there. So the questions are uh, these. Uh, your reactions to the film, uh, what might have surprised you the most and why, and uh, what was your favorite story in the film and why. So if you would just kind of spend a moment to think and, and type, and maybe uh, Malia will help me by passing on some of the distilling and passing on some of what, what we hear. Um, so, uh, the, some of the reactions are ones that we, we kind of love to hear, the, uh, um, the comment about just listening, uh, to us was like really precious, uh, the prisoner story, of course, uh, the daily huddles are started a year ago, but I'm not sure that unfortunately they've become a really, uh, regular pro pro uh, process, um, Collard greens, for those of you who know Southern food, like it's a huge one. Uh, and uh, then an appreciation about the housekeepers being the extra eyes and ears and hands for all of us. Uh, do housekeepers play a bigger role in patient interactions than nurses and doctors? I think sometimes that's the case. Uh, sometimes, and we'll talk about this in a moment, housekeepers have more time and are more, how to say this, on a on the same level of looking at things than, than our patients, as our patients are, and that makes a giant difference. Uh, somebody who was recently in the hospital and had a wonderful relationship with the housekeepers, and, uh, uh, and it's, again, a question about the daily huddles, which I'll come back to in a few minutes. Okay, thank you for these comments. You can keep them coming and we'll look at them. Uh, we'll keep looking at them as we go through. I'm gonna switch gears and, um, uh, have a conversation with Joanne Hunter. There's a wonderful dog in the background of your screen, Tess, by the way. <laughs> okay, uh, so Joanne, we're just meeting really for the first time and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, could you say just a few words, first of all, about how long you've been at Duke Hospital and, and, and what your daily job is, what your day-to-day -day job is like as a housekeeper? Well, yes, um, I've been working working here at Duke for two years. And um, I always wanted to, to work at a hospital around patients. And my, my duties is to uh, do the patient's room, do the patient clean, and take care of the unit as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I guess for what I've learned from uh, your coworkers is that you've also won a bunch of awards for the way that you've kind of interacted with patients and how much they appreciate you. So maybe you could say a word about how that happens and how that feels to you and so forth and so on. Well, it's, I'm overwhelmed with it because I'm not doing it for a reward. I'm just doing it because I'm not going to the room and sometimes the patients don't feel well, they won't say good morning. 
that don't discourage me. When I go back again to do my cleaning, I, you know, we'll talk. And then sometimes they will apologize about this morning that they wasn't feeling good or didn't get no sleep or something. But it is my pleasure just knowing them and talking to them. Mm. And we talk about. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Joanne. And we talk about our families and um, where where they're from and all kinds of things. I just love it. Uh huh. Wow. And so the film is made a couple of years ago. I think just before you started working at Duke. So my big question for you is like now with with this horrible COVID situation. Uh, what do you notice is different about your job or what, what, what has changed about the patients and the loneliness and so forth and so on? Well, yeah, I came in right before, right before the COVID when the visitors was allowed to come in all throughout the day. And since the COVID, you know, of course the, the visitors are limited. So the patients are lonely and they don't have any, any guests to come in. They want to, they miss the family and loved ones and they don't have them to come in to see them like they want to. So I try to fill in and be there for them to sort of keep them occupied and, you know, do little things for them. I go down to the gift shop and get them little things if I can help them out with anything. Like I had wow. one the other day, she needed a charger for her phone and she was so worried because she couldn't talk to her daughter. And I told her, let's calm down. I go down to the gift shop and see if I can find you one. Well, wow. it took it took me about 30 minutes, but I put the biggest smile on her face. <laughs> and she don't mind, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of story we love to hear. And so much, how to say this, it's so much what housekeepers do, and it's so much what sometimes we as doctors and nurses don't notice. Uh -huh. so that's, and that's why we made the film, and that's why I'm so delighted that you're joining, joining this conference today. Do you have worries about COVID? It must be scary at times to be in contact with people. Well, I tell you, Neil, when I first heard, when COVID first came, I was afraid to work here. Uh, and I was scared to take something home to my family. And then when I kept hearing about essential workers and uh, heroes and uh, workers like that, I wanted to be one of those. So I put my stuff in third gear and I found all the new changes and stuff that we needed to do. I applied them and I, it worked out fine. I was glad to come to work every day to help keep the virus from attacking the whole building. Right. Well, well thank you, because yeah. the cleaning is what we can do to keep the virus. Uh, yes, and I went over and beyond. <laughs> that's, really, that's really wonderful. You, you, you are among the heroes, and that's kind of why we have this film and why we have it, we're talking about all of this today. So I'm going to just uh, thank you for, for all of that. I'm going to look quickly in the questions and answers to see if there's anyone's that I uh, was asked to ask you. Okay. Uh, one second. Uh, um, uh, no, it's just, it's all about uh, the favorite stories and we'll get back to those later. Okay. Joanne, I would love for you to hang around for the conversation if you have time, but I know you have to uh, get back to work and get home. So I'll leave that up to you, eh? But I'll just thank you again for being with us. And let's be sure to stay in touch so when we make our next film, you can be a star. Yes, sir. Anytime. I'll be glad to be on it. Okay, cool. You take care. Be well. I'll see you around the hospital, I hope. Uh, okay, you will. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. Okay. I'm hoping you can still hear me. Um, and... Uh, Okay, so I just want to uh, thank you for your reactions to the film. Uh, there were a few other questions in the chat that I'll, uh, I'll try to respond to a little bit later about the, the character, the technique for the film and uh, how doctors respond to patients giving advice, uh, to housekeepers giving advice to patients. I just want to, I want to leave plenty of time for conversation. And so uh, I want to just, um, go through some uh, of the research about housekeepers and kind of what informs our thinking about how to use this film uh, in education. So first of all, at some point, I decided to go back and look at sort of the positive messages of the stories, breaking them down into categories. And it struck me that one of the really important ones is just the act of noticing, noticing when the room is too small, when the family doesn't have money, uh, when the mom may be about to drop her baby. Then there's the stories that go around encouragement or listening, uh, just listen. Uh, the advice ones about, uh, for example, the one about lactation. And then the generosity, 
whether it's uh, the family that needed money for sharing the dinner or needed the needed money or the one that shared the potluck dinner or graciously receiving uh, the example of the collard seeds. So one of the themes that we found ourselves really focusing on uh, after the film and after doing research related to the film is that around being valued or devalued at work. And there are a couple of studies that really jumped out at us uh, about hospital housekeepers and how they're treated in the hospital environment. And the first one was actually by Messing and it was in medical anthropology a number of years ago. And it was a study of uh, focus groups and educational sessions for cleaners in different parts of the province of Quebec, Canada. And uh, in all of the sessions universally, uh, the housekeepers complained about feeling uh, invisible to the workers, co-workers not being included in celebrations. Um, when a patient died, nobody recognized the way they were feeling as was mentioned in the film. And even little things like when they, the hospital bought new furniture, they bought furniture that was virtually impossible to clean without ever kind of checking in with the housekeepers about uh, how that might affect how they do their job. Uh, in several establishments, believe it or not, the cleaners were forbidden to talk to the patients. And one woman described her embarrassment when with no warning, her supervisor announced over the speaker system that no patients were to talk to her because it interferes with her work. So the larger study that was published just several years ago, which is at the University of Michigan, is about the whole topic of being valued and devalued at work. And I think it teaches us a lot about housekeepers, but also about a lot of things that happen in our work and daily environments. And in this study, the main conclusion is this, that the meaning of our work and the worth we feel in doing that work depends on a series of daily interactions with others. And there were two groups of hospital cleaners and face-to-face -face interviews with 29 housekeepers who were selected randomly. And there were some very powerful examples of housekeepers feeling devalued or denied a sense of worth or substance. And they came down to things like not recognizing a cleaner's presence, actually communicating disgust or disdain toward the cleaner, making a cleaner's job more difficult, and communicating negative information to the cleaner. The not recognizing was the most common uh, complaint, that the doctors look at us like we're not even there, no recognition whatsoever. They would see me every weekend and never say hello or order lunch and never ask me to order out lunch. I don't think it's a black thing. I think it's just because I'm an outsider. And then, and the doctors stand in the way. And this is a very frequent complaint. I mean, literally stand in the way. You can ask them to move every day, the same doctors every day. They just have no regard for whatever anyone else is doing in the hallway. I don't think the doctors value our work the way they should. Uh, they throw something on the floor and just, you know, look at it like she'll pick it up. And some feel they're next to God. So for instance, I'm cleaning the room or waxing and a doctor walks right through. Uh, communicating their information. The, our relationship with the nurses is very important. They don't communicate to me sometimes and they call and they talk to my supervisor, which is very aggravating because they only get one side of the story. And then there are the valuing interactions, which are unfortunately much less common, which are recognizing the cleaner's presence, treating the cleaner as a group member, making the job easier and communicating patient information. Uh, and so there were small actions of recognition and friendliness. There were experiences very positive, building a sense of a mutuality with the other. For example, being invited by nurses to participate in a potluck meal. I have some nurses who move equipment for me instead of looking at me like, oh, he's a housekeeper, he can move it himself. That puts us on the same level as far as they can respect my, my job, just as well as I respect their job. So we learned that most cleaners take pride in effectively executing their vital work. Our most important insight is that felt worth on the job is tied importantly to what happens in social interactions with the full spectrum of individuals that one encounters while doing their jobs. The meaning of work and the worth we feel in doing that work depends on a series of daily interactions with others. So I just want to jump ahead and we, we touched briefly on the issues related to COVID, uh, but I just wanna add a couple more thoughts and um, observations about that. Uh, I think there are, as, as, as I was discussing with uh, Ms. Hunter, I think there are two possible issues to be addressed. And one is what we call this parallel pandemic of loneliness, which is in many hospitals uh, for a while and even still now, there are no visitors and people are suffering and sometimes dying alone. And so if you think about the emotional support provided by housekeepers in the past, you can imagine how much, how much amplified that was 
uh, in, in the present time. But sadly, the other side of that coin is the risk of infection that's faced by housekeepers. And in fact, especially early on in the pandemic, but to this very day, there are examples of housekeepers not being provided the vital protective equipment that they need to keep themselves safe. And housekeepers who've died uh, on the job or because of the job, and in some cases, trace back to that very uh, form of uh, discrimination. Uh, housekeepers have been often among the more marginalized communities in our country. Discrimination and uh, sadly, some of the wealthiest health systems with CEOs who are uh, making in the millions of dollars of salary a year are the ones who pleaded poverty when it came to providing uh, PPE. So here's one article that was the, about the other hospital workers and uh, about the lack of equipment, poor communication and safety information. And people are getting, putting their lives at risk without any praise. And there's a dilemma of staying at home and risking losing your job or going to work and getting infected and spreading that to loved ones and perhaps getting sick and losing your job and then having no health insurance. And then this one, which was a very powerful op-ed piece in the Baltimore Sun by Annette Brown, who is a hospital housekeeper, who says, I'm an essential worker scared for my life every day with no extra pay benefits for the risk. And it highlights the fear of contracting COVID-19. They view their work as essential, but there's no essential pay benefits or protection and a call for essential pay and more protection PPE for cleaners. So I'm going to uh, stop there, and uh, we've left a fair amount of time for conversation, which I was, had hoped for. A few of the things we might could talk about in the remaining time is ways that we might improve our daily interactions with hospital housekeepers. Are there practical ways to recognize the caring work and actually include them in our team? And also, how must health systems change to honor and respect housekeepers and to keep them safe? And I'll just mention, finally, that we've just submitted for publication a complete curriculum for the film, which we hope will enable it to be used in classroom settings for an hour, an hour and a half of conversation. And we welcome other ideas for using the film in an educational environment. So I'm gonna stop there. There's my email if you need it. And I'm gonna stop sharing the screen if I can figure out how to do that. And, um, and then, uh, or not, one second. You're fine, Neil. We, it's okay we, now? Yeah, we can see you. And I'm going to actually, um, I guess, um, take my, uh, like, uh, I guess, uh, take the privilege of, of, of being the, the sort of host here and ask um, you the first question. And I'll give Malia a chance to maybe consolidate a few of the comments or questions uh, for you going forward. Um, uh, my question is really about um, what you're working on currently or maybe in the near future. I mean, I'm so interested in, in the Health Humanities Lab, which I think just sounds like a, a terrific and, and, and such just a creative enterprise. And so I'm, I'm you know, thinking what, what's next for, for, for your team? Yeah, well, two things. On behalf of the lab, our main project now is trying to create a major or a minor or a curriculum in health humanities at our university. And it's, a, it's been an, up, it's an uphill struggle to be really honest. And we're, we remain hopeful, but um, uh, this, you know, we're, we're in a financial situation of sorts where it seems there's no money for this on one hand. On the other hand, we feel this is really an emergency because we don't want to have a whole other generation of doctors who are oblivious to racism and to the humanities and medicine. And we think it's time, the sooner that changes, the better. That's one of my our projects. And then personally, I'm working on a, uh, a, speech, a talk and a paper on uh, the digital divide and how it affects telemedicine. Uh, I've done telemedicine for three months at home before I went back to clinic. And there are two worlds of telemedicine. There's the people with laptops and good internet, and there's the others, or the ones who don't speak English, who speak Spanish. Uh, and so, um, uh, and so, um, I, those are the things I'm working on uh, at this point. And um, I, I, um, I got a message from David to share the screen. I'm not sure if that's going to help with the citations, but I can get them to people later. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. 
Tess, I hope that answered your question. You did. You did answer my question. And um, I would be always happy to cheerlead uh, for both you and Ray as somebody who has got a minor in place as well as a certificate program. So I'll wow. kind of a shout out Please. to our work. Please. Um, if you would give a call to our college president, I'd really I, appreciate it. Oh, I'm sure that will make a difference. Okay. Um, Malia, I'm going to let you take it from here. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Proust, and everyone for joining us today. I invite you to continue to type your questions and reactions into the chat. And Dr. Proust, if it's okay with you, maybe we can send around those slides that you mentioned after the program to the people on sure. our registration list so that they can see those citations. Absolutely. Uh, great. So I'm going to read a few more of the comments that people typed in earlier, and then I'll get to some questions as well. Thank you, Malia. Absolutely. So we had a lot of general comments of um, enjoying the film, the film resonating. Um, some people shared some personal connections. Um, so one person wrote, I enjoyed the film, loved the environmental service staff, and all they did for my father when he was hospitalized. Another person wrote, the video helped me appreciate environmental services and housekeepers as another point of contact with patients. There are extra eyes, ears, and hands for working for and with the medical and nursing team. Um, I just, I'll just interrupt you briefly to say, it's, it's, um, it's fascinating to me how often uh, folks who see the film have a story about a housekeeper in the hospital. It seems more common than not that people have, have already made that connection in their mind about the way hospital, hospital housekeepers keepers greeted them. Or, and it can be transport workers and, and food service workers also. I shouldn't just say housekeepers. Uh, it's just happening all the time. And, and the film was just made to bring that to people's attention. Another story that resonated, I love this video and really enjoyed hearing the stories. I was especially touched by the woman talking about the first time a patient she had just interacted with had a code blue and how her colleagues said it would happen again and she would get a little stronger each time. All of the housekeepers resonated so much strength along with kindness. And then the last comment I'll read right now, we can return to more of these. Um, someone wrote, deeply touching, what beautiful, amazing people. Thank you for all you contribute, not only with your hard work, but with all you do to help patients heal. Your caring and compassion are inspirational and a model for all of us. That's wonderful, thanks. And are there some questions as well? Or Yeah, uh, yeah, so um, one question. Um, thanks to everyone who made and featured was featured in this film for their efforts. As housekeepers put in so much additional time and emotional labor and support to patients in unique ways, are these additional contributions being recognized in any meaningful way by Duke Health as an organization? And there's a couple more parts to this. Are such interactions supported formally or informally by hospital administration or are they discouraged? And how has the film been received by the Duke Health System? Wow, okay, I'm gonna choose my words very carefully. Um, I, yes, I, I think that by, by and large, uh, I don't know of any, I don't know of any case in our hospital where these efforts have not been supported. So I have to say that I'm proud to say that in fact, uh, this is something that housekeepers, it's not like in Quebec where they were told not to talk to the patients. This is something that housekeepers are encouraged to do. I think with respect to, are, is there any special recognition? Um, I, I'm, I, I, I think there is. There are certainly kind of uh, patient-centered care awards that go to housekeepers. That was what, one of the ones that um, Ms. Hunter received. Uh, I think that um, the issue around, the issues that were raised in the newspaper article around hazard pay and, uh, issues like that. And, and, and if, if anybody's actually getting any, uh, any real recognition, financial recognition, I should say, for the extra work that's done. Uh, I, I, I won't focus on Duke because it's a national issue around the fact that, uh, you know, $15 an hour is, is not, you know, is, is not happening in so many, in so many essential service jobs. So the, the answer has to be like, 
things really need to get better and things really need to change. Okay, there's another question related to Duke and clarifying the work process. Um, it sounded like when I was watching the video, it sounded like the housekeepers introduced themselves. Uh, this question is, how does Duke inter introduce environmental service workers to patients? Are they included in the care team info the same way that nurses and physicians are uh, mentioned on whiteboards, digital or otherwise? Yeah, this, I, um, gosh, that's a really good question. I think that uh, there's somebody from environmental services who comes around uh, and explains the role of the housekeeper and mentions who the housekeeper is going to be or is. Uh, but I'm not sure that's 100%. And I think that from what I understand from our interviews, that most of the housekeepers take it upon themselves to write their name on the whiteboard and, uh, and make sure the patient knows you know, who they are and a little bit about them as well. Okay, and this one you kind of touched upon a little bit, um, but somebody is asking, as doctors, what can you learn from environmental services to improve your patient interaction and care? Do you feel that the medical aspects of being a doctor diminishes your ability to interact with patients the same way environmental services does? Yes, I, I think in many, there's so many things we could say about that. Um, what, we could, what we could learn is just, uh, you know, take the time to listen. Uh, the average doctor interrupts in the first 17 seconds of the medical interview, and it's hard to get us to change. So that's certainly one thing. I think the other thing is getting off the pedestal, because one of the reasons that I think that housekeepers are able to connect with patients is that they're, they, there's not as much of a power differential. So I think the, the extent that we can find ways to kind of minimize that differential or, or de-emphasize it, uh, we, we, make, uh, we make better connections. Uh, and I, I, I think, you know, this has been said so many times, but uh, I think medical, edu medical education in the main uh, takes the empathy out of people, out of students. And so what, what they might have been inclined to do or say when they were 18 or 19, 20 years old, they may have lost track of that by that time they're 27 or 28 or 29. So there's a, there's a lot to be learned. And so the film is not just about appreciating housekeepers, but it's also highlighting the kind of things we all should be doing and often uh, we fail to do. Thanks. So I have another one here that's really interesting. Um, somebody wrote, do any providers have issues with not wanting housekeeper, housekeeping staff to give advice that could be interpreted as medical advice, such as encouraging the LVAD? That's one that came up for me too. And I'm wondering if for context, um, since we have over 100 people on and they may not all have a medical background, if you could also just let us know what an LVAD is. <laughs> Thank you. I have to confess that I had to learn what an LVAD is when we made the film. So an LVAD is like is a pump that assists your heart to pump, pump blood around your body. I think it stands for left ventricular assistance device, something like that. And as far as um, we've never, I've never heard a complaint uh, about housekeepers uh, offering advice or um, or uh, encouragement. Uh, I'm not sure it would have come to me if it had happened. So I can't say that it never happens. Uh, but we didn't, I guess there could have been pushback when we showed the film all over the medical center and nobody said, well, the housekeeper shouldn't be doing this or shouldn't be doing that. Even around the housekeeper giving lactation advice, uh, nobody seemed to feel that was inappropriate. So we're happy about that. Yeah, I think that's an interesting one because they're, they're kind of giving advice as a friend, but because they're in a hospital setting, it could be interpreted as professional medical advice. Yeah. It's all very, thanks for mentioning that and bring, and I think it's complicated. I think, uh, how to say this properly, I, there's so many, there are a lot of rules that constrain what we do. And uh, I think um, fear from, from, the, from the sort of administrative end of a hospital, sometimes fear seems to dominate over opportunities to empathize and connect with people. Fear that somebody might get sued, fear that something might go wrong. Uh, and I think we just have to always keep that in balance, but it's easier to, um, it's easier to cave into fear than to think about creative ways that we can actually do things that are new and different and, and helpful. Okay, another person is wondering, um, 
what can other healthcare workers do to help the housekeeping staff keep doing the great work that they are doing? Well, the, the film, um, I think there are, several, there are several issues. One is sort of on a personal level, uh, uh, just knowing, knowing your housekeeper's name and con connecting and asking. Uh, you know, these things are going on all around you if you work in a hospital. And if you're not aware of it, it's because you're not, you haven't up until now made an effort to be aware of it. So I think there's something just in the personal level. But also this, there's so many structural things that need to change uh, uh, about the kind of recognition and the, uh, and, and can has, are housekeepers being included in, on hospital rounds as they have been in some, in some hospitals? Are they, um, you know, are, are they, in, when a patient dies, do they find out about it? And how do they find out? Uh, so there, there's all these different levels, both on a personal interaction level, but maybe more so on a structural level. Uh, and we, we all know that racism becomes a factor in this as well in terms of how, how folks are treated. So um, there's, it's all of those things and, and, and probably a lot more. Okay, here's a question getting at some of the institutional aspects of this career. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or if you've heard um, uh, any particular justifications from your hospital system. The question is, why do most hospitals use third parties for the employment of housekeepers? Shouldn't the housekeepers be hired and paid by the hospital system itself? Um, if this was the case, they would have benefits and hopefully a better wage as well. Yeah, I, 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 there's been a bunch written about this. My personal opinion, uh, and it's not a management opinion, obviously, is this is a horrible step backwards, this third party, you know, hiring cleaning services to hire the, the housekeepers because they're not, uh, for so many different reasons, um, but then, then they, they're no longer, uh, it cuts them off from the mission of the hospital as well as uh, it probably has a negative effect on wages and working conditions. So this is, this is something that's happened, like this whole outsourcing of everything, uh, you know, is a, is, is a disastrous component of like neoliberalism and this new era of, you know, whatever kind of capitalism we're now in. Um, it's terrible, and uh, to the extent that people are starting to question this, even if it's just, even if it's um, kind of, you know, uh, um, in the drive, you know, like the driving, uh, the drivers on um, all of those kind of services, uh, you know, Uber and places like that. I mean, this stuff has really uh, had such a negative impact on so many people. And we had multiple comments in, in the Q&A about low pay. Um, so that was that question kind of embodied a lot of them, but it's, it's clearly a, a concern, I think, for, for all of us. Yeah, I have to say, and, and this is always, this really, uh, this is complex because we consciously decided not to make that our film. And I, and I, I still pain about it at times because I don't want to, I've never wanted to create the impression that this is sort of a uh, paradise for, for hospital housekeepers, anything but. But we decided to make a film about this thing, which is the emotional connections and the emotional experiences of housekeepers. And we, and not but, but and we're aware of all, we're so aware of those issues. So we, we really hope that the whole what's happening in this country now, um, uh, the unions, that so many things will enable a, a, a brighter future for people like housekeepers. I'll share a few more comments and then uh, one more question that came up a couple of times. Um, so related to what, what we were just discussing, uh, somebody wrote, I understand that sometimes housekeepers can feel overlooked by MDs and others as if they're invisible. I was a custodial work worker in the beginning of my career, and I've always said that everyone should have to work a day in custodial care. It's very eye-opening and has always made me very appreciative of the work that they do. I wonder if, as part of residency, if residents can shadow the custodial staff briefly so that they can acknowledge the work they do and create more appreciation and empathy. That's, that's a wonderful idea. I don't think any residency review committee would allow that, which is part of the way fear dominates over empathy. But I have to say that at least in our reimagined medicine course that Tess mentioned, the uh, medical students, or these are actually undergraduates who are going into medicine, did spend a day shadowing the housekeepers. 
and developed a real, got to know at least one person really pretty well. And uh, it was really, it should be done everywhere. It was a good experience for them. Another quick comment. Um, amazing work as a Latina nurse. I look forward to our service keepers as they are valuable with Spanish speaking patients and families. I am always grateful for their hard work in keeping the hospital functioning. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so important. And we, we, we ended up doing the interviews in Spanish because those two women, those two women speak English quite well, but they were so much more expressive in Spanish, we realized right away. Um, but that role is invaluable because there's so much that's lost in translation. And uh, to be, to have, for doctors who don't speak Spanish, to have to bring in a formal interpreter at every occasion, you know, when you have a housekeeper, you can just have a real conversation on a kind of peer to peer basis. So uh, we especially loved uh, having th those two women in the film. Fantastic. So we're just about out of time, uh, but one more question that came up a couple of times in the Q&A is people are wondering if the environmental service workers are included in the huddles um, at Duke or if you know of that happening in other locations and if it's common or if it's something that is is recommended um, so that hospitals feel like they're part of that care team. The huddle is a really good idea, but I have to confess, and I should know the answer to this, when Isaac in the film talked about the huddle, I'm not sure if it was something that's aspirational or something that's happening every day or something that happened for a while and then stopped happening, I need to find out. But the concept is, the concept nonetheless, is about having you know, the entire team, including the housekeepers, have a brief conversation every day that uh, just is covering whatever needs to be covered. And, uh, this, and the issue that he mentioned is so powerful, which is uh, you know, the nurses and doctors, when a child dies or an older patient dies, we have ways to to debrief and grieve. And the housekeepers are often completely left out of that process. So that has to change. That's with huddles or without huddles, that thing has to change. Thank you so much again for being here. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Tess Jones to see if she has any final comments. Well, I, I do have final comments. I, I wanna thank, thank you, Neil, for um, joining us today. Um, I, Malia touched on so many of the incredible, um, incredible uh, warm and congratulatory compliments. People um, were very touched by the film, as am I. I. This was probably the fourth or fifth time I've watched it and it still just sort of brings tears to my eyes um, as, as I do watch it. Um, I also want to thank our team because it does, as you, as you, as your film points out, and as you have acknowledged several times, it does take a village here. And so I want to thank Malia, um, who um, did such a great job um, bringing the questions and comments to the fore. I want to thank David, um, David Weil, for all the technical support and the help. I know he's just. Um, he's, he's a rock through this and, and, um, I want to thank Heather, Heather Clough, who, um, keeps, keeps us all, um, on, uh, on track here. And I want to mention Michael and Paul, um, they are the AV people behind the curtain. Um, and so they were very, um, instrumental in making all this happen today. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you were doing. I, um, I agree with you. This film raises so many issues, so many issues, um, you know, institutional issues, fairness issues, structural issues, but it has, this film has heart and it, and it is just a, a beautiful way to begin a conversation about those other issues that, that uh, came up and, and especially just to think about the, you know, acknowledging the people who take care of everyone in the hospital um, not just, you know, the staff, um, the medical staff, but the people, you know, I was thinking about the people who are, you know, in the cafeteria, the people who are keeping the coffee coming, the people who are feeding and caring for everybody who's taking care of, every, of everyone else. So um, I think that this film reminds us that um, there are a lot of people who do a lot of things to keep, to keep everybody um, safe and 
and well in that environment. So thank you so much for this. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Well, okay. Well, I think we pulled this off. I know that we're going to share your slides so that people can um, get the citations yeah. um, and the, for the, the articles that you brought to our attention. Right. Um, and please give Joanne another, another round of applause. She was Many, many people were very, very impressed and, and, and very moved by her words. So we really thank her for coming and joining us as well. Yeah. So take care of yourself. We look forward to the next film. Okay. We'll let you know. All right. Thank you In so the meantime, much. Stay safe, everybody. Be well. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.